So thank you. Thank you for being here today. Today is the Sunday Forum at First Unitarian Society in Milwaukee. We have them every Sunday during the church year, and we're so glad that you joined us. Um, I just wanted to let you know that there will be a, uh, sometime during the program, there'll be a basket that'll be passed. And if you're prepared and would like to put some money in, that's for donations to help with our expenses with our equipment and our our microphones and things like that for the forum. So that's what that's for. And then um, also uh, we're recruiting and building our group, our forum planning work group. So there's information about that over on the bench and you can pick that up. There's some more, just call me. Um, we'll, we'll try to build that up and that'll be great. Okay, and now I'm going to ask Jerry to step up. He's our host for today, and he's going to introduce our presenter. Thanks, Lorraine. Thanks for coming today to hear Jer Jay Heck. He's no stranger to this forum. He's been here many times. He's an old friend. It's good to have him back. As you know, he's Executive Director of Common Cause of Wisconsin. He's had that job for many, many years. Uh, one thing about uh, Jay is a little aside to what he does, what he's gonna be speaking about today. Uh, Jay, Jay is a big coffee drinker. And so one thing uh, that he really appreciated was these coffee cups that we used to give him. And these are really tall, elegant coffee cups we used to have. And he, he took a picture of it and he posted it on our Facebook page in a real elegant setting, you know, and. So he just was really enthused about these coffee cups. Then of course, he broke the coffee cup. So That's anyway, cool. he came back for another four and we still had these nice coffee cups. And guess what he did? He broke the cup. Next. <laughs> so our fancy coffee cups are gone, uh, but we do have these kind of knockoff coffee cups now. And so he's gonna get one of those to take home with him. So with that, uh, Jay, Jay's gonna talk about stuff other than coffee this morning, so. Oh, thank you, thank you. Mm -hmm. Jay, that's wonderful. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, it is a great pleasure to be back here. Uh, I think this is maybe my fourth time. So that's four coffee mugs I've gone through. <laughs> In fairness, uh, they're great coffee mugs. And so if you use it every day, you know, eventually it's going to meet, meet its demise somehow or uh, the other. And usually in my case, it was dropping it or something. But uh, I did send Jerry uh, as, a, as a joke, uh, a picture of a mug that had a picture of Donald Trump on it. I said, I'm reduced to using this now. So I need to come back to get <laughs> and it worked so you know that's 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 the reason i'm here um so a couple things number one i am uh like many of you um a refugee from another faith uh and have uh, became a unitarian in madison where i live first unitarian society um in 1997 96 um uh, my, my wife, my ex-wife and I decided that we wanted to ground our children in something so that they would have the option of rejecting it later. <laughs> so so uh, we, we, uh, we elected to go to the Unitarian Church in Madison and it was a, it was a wonderful experience. Uh, I don't know if you're familiar with Michael Schuler, but for many years he was, uh, he was the lead pastor there and he was a source of great inspiration. Um, not just spiritually, but just uh, just civically and ethically, and uh, just a great role model for uh, my children and in our community. And and so when he left, I uh, I did what Unitarians sometimes do. I I also left. I I I, I describe myself uh, to often to people as uh, the lowest form of religious life, a lapsed Unitarian. Which is to say that uh, I was I, I was unable to continue to commit to a system that is open to everything, open to all beliefs. Which which 
which always, you know, gets a, gets a few Snickers. Uh, I am a cafeteria Unitarian, though. I do go on holidays, Christmas and, and the holidays. So, so, so there is that. And I do, I do try to continue to support FUS uh, uh, financially to some degree. So again, this is very familiar to me. I'm, I'm very, very pleased to be with you. Uh, Jerry, as he may have mentioned, is a longtime friend a longtime member of Common Cause uh, of Wisconsin. Um, I also want to point out uh, that today here is uh, Alice Hanson Drew. Uh, and Alice um, and her late husband, Mike Drew, who was, as you may remember, the media critic for the Milwaukee Journal Sentinel for many years. Um, Mike was for many years a member of the Common Cause Wisconsin State Board and uh, a great friend and a great source of, uh, of inspiration and support as well, uh, primarily with his very wicked sense of humor. So he was, uh, he, he was just a marvelous person. So it's always, I always feel very comfortable in an uh, in environment like this. Um, and I have spoken, into, spoken in a number of unfriendly environments over the years. So, so this, is a, this is a pleasing one. I, th I thought what I would talk about today is uh, sort of a, 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 the temperature of democracy uh, in Wisconsin, because um, I don't have to tell you that, uh, and you know we said this in 2020, but it's even more important this year, that the stakes for democracy and for representative government uh, have never been higher. And uh, it's, it's just so true because uh, of not only what happened in 2016 and then the four years that followed that, but uh, what's happened since 2020. And, you know, Wisconsin, once again, whether we like it or not, is going to be one of the crucibles the, the, in the crossroads. We're going to be one of those two or three states uh, that will decide uh, who the next president of the United States is, and I and I would argue what the future of uh, the democracy is. Uh, so it's a uh, I get a little emotional about it because it's such a it's such a, a a tough thing to talk about uh, when you see so many things happening that are that are alarming and 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 uh, and that make you sad. On the other hand. Uh, I'm here to tell you not a, not a sad story. Uh, I, I want to tell you what's happening in Wisconsin and why I think uh, the future is bright here, as well as uh, bright for uh, the rest of the country. And, you know, it really starts, I think, as you well know, the fact that this is and always has been, at least for the last 50 years, probably the closest thing to a brilliantly purple state of any state in the country. Uh, this is very evenly divided between, uh, between Republicans and Democrats. And the difference though is when I moved to Wisconsin uh, 35 years ago from, from Washington DC, this was a state where although there were Republicans and Democrats and elections switched back and forth regularly, uh, there was a there was a sense and a consensus about what the general welfare and the good for the citizenry of Wisconsin was all about. And so certainly I would argue as late as uh, the late 1990s uh, and even into the early 2000s, Republicans would win statewide elections, Democrats would, it would go back and forth, evenly divided, but uh, there still seemed to be the ability to broker compromise, which is now considered a dirty word, not just by the right, but, but by many on the left, which I think is a, which is a huge problem. And there was a bipartisan consensus on a whole host of issues that made Wisconsin the state that it was through much of the 20th century, which was the beacon for progressive uh, not only reform, but for clean politics, for civil politics, and for uh, a bipartisanship that always placed the good of the people above the personal political fortunes of one political party or the other. There were, of course, great exceptions. Uh, 
Senator Joseph McCarthy <laughs> uh, was, was obviously one of those big exceptions. But, but by and large, uh, the consensus held and the bipartisanship was something that held as well. And that really fundamentally changed, you could argue in the late 1990s when Newt Gingrich took over as the Speaker of the US House of Representatives and brought in a whole new divisive style of politics at the national level, which then uh, filtered into Wisconsin because some of the people who were his, his disciples, if you can use such a word, uh, people like Scott Jensen and some other people, Scott Walker, these were people who were schooled in the school of division. And their decision was, we're no longer going to try to work with the other party. We're going to try to tear the other party down. And not only that, but we're going to try to make Wisconsin into something that it's not. And that is a conservative bastion, a state that is steeped in conservative far-right ideology even though this state, just as it always has been, is equally divided between the two parties. And I would even argue that uh, it's trending less red and more blue uh, as the years uh, go along. So uh, that's sort of the backdrop. Common Cause is a nonpartisan organization. We do not endorse candidates for public office. But we do have a specific set of principles and issues on democracy. And that's really what we're about, is, uh, is, is trying to promote democracy. And for instance, we think more people being able to vote rather than less is a positive thing. We think that, uh, that legislative and congressional districts ought to be drawn in such a way so that voters actually have a real choice between their uh, candidates and that the uh, outcome isn't preordained before an election. A whole host of other things. We think there's too much money in our political system that it inundates and corrupts politicians. It's not free speech. It's very much fee speech. And it does alienate a whole host of people who don't have the means to participate uh, with their checkbooks. Uh, or I guess Venmo is now the, <laughs> what you say. It's not just... Nobody, nobody writes checks anymore. But the point being is that our principles and our position on those issues has never wavered, certainly in the 29 years that I've been with Common Cause and in the 50 years that Common Cause has been in existence. What has changed over time is the position of the national and state political parties. When I came to Wisconsin, again, in the late 1980s, there was bipartisan consensus that there was too much money in politics. The people that I worked most closely with to try to rein in special interest money were Republicans in Wisconsin. Senator Michael Ellis of Nina, Senator Dale Schultz of Richland Center. Uh, these were moderate Republicans. I actually myself grew up uh, in Cleveland, Ohio and in, Pen and in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, a family of, of moderate Republicans. We were what were called Rockefeller Republicans. And I guess in Wisconsin, the, uh, the, the, uh, the parallel would be Warren Knowles or Lee Sherman Dreyfus Republicans. Uh, and again, these were people that were not ideologically fixed to the right or the left. They just happened to be out of the party of Lincoln or the party of FDR, and that was their tradition. And again, the consensus and the ability to reach bipartisan compromise uh, was always not that far away. And that was certainly the case in Wisconsin uh, when I moved here. But as you know, nationally um, and in Wisconsin, that changed very much. And, and of course, in Wisconsin, uh, it was really accelerated uh, beginning in the 2010 elections when Scott Walker and the Republicans seized unified control of the legislature and the governorship. And that was kind of unusual because for the 50 years prior to that, we've usually had divided government. We had a Republican or Democratic governor, a legislature, at least one chamber or the other of the other party. So that necessitated compromise. That necessitated the need to come to consensus. But Scott Walker, who portrayed in his own mind himself as the new Ronald Reagan, 
decided that he wanted to shift Wisconsin, not only to the right, but to the far right. And so the thing I always like to point out is that the 2010 election, when he was elected, it was a national Republican year. Republicans won control of the Wisconsin legislature for one reason and one reason only. We had competitive seats then. We didn't have a gerrymander. We didn't have seats divided in such a way that you knew what the outcome was going to be. And one of the things that Scott Walker and the Republican controlled legislature immediately did in 2011 was pass, and their first order of business was to pass a whole host of undemocratic with a small d measures to try to ensure that they would have one party control in Wisconsin, not just for the next election, but for the next decade and maybe for the next generation. So they proceeded to do a number of things. They dismantled the public financing system in Wisconsin for state elections and spending limits. That was followed closely by instituting the most extreme, most prohibitive photo ID law in the country for voting. Wisconsin allows the fewest forms of photo ID to show at a polling place when you're voting than any other state other than Texas now, which is finally just past Wisconsin in terms of the severity of their photo ID law. They made it very difficult. Why was that? Because they knew that people, the, that people living in bigger cities would not have cars and that uh, depend on public transportation. And so therefore utilizing a driver's license as a form of ID was not easily or readily accessible nor did many people in those areas have it. And that was an advantage, obviously, for Republicans. They extended that prohibition and that difficulty to college students, making it difficult for students who didn't have a Wisconsin driver's license to vote here. On many UW campuses today, and many private colleges in Wisconsin, the photo ID that's issued by the university is not voter compliant. You have to get a different ID on campus in order to vote. And as the father of now two out of college students, I can tell you the last thing in the world you're going to be able to do is to get your children to focus on getting another ID to vote when there's so many other things they can do with their time. Uh, and, and, and that's not really one of the, their priorities. The point I'm making is that these were the types of things that were passed in the early 2010s, 2011. That was followed by the most partisan gerrymander, which is the redistricting process, the most partisan of any state in the country in 2011, uh, particularly on the Republican side. There were a number of other states that also gerrymandered their legislatures in their congressional districts. My native state of Ohio, Pennsylvania, North Carolina, Michigan, a number of other states, but Wisconsin's was the most egregious. And it worked like a charm because from the 2012 election through the 2022 election, when the Republican redistricting process was in place, there was barely a change at all through an election of any state legislative seat, both in the state assembly of which there's 99 seats or in the state Senate of which there's 33. Even though there were statewide shifts, Governor Evers, for instance, defeated Scott Walker in 2018 and Democrats were elected to all the statewide offices. As you know, uh, gerrymandering is not a factor in a statewide election because it's all of the votes of all of the people in the state that determine who's governor, who's attorney general uh, and, and the rest for statewide office. But in the districts, nary a one changed because of an election, even though Democrats were getting 54% of all the votes cast in the legislative election, they ended up in 2018 and going into 2019 with 36% of the seats in the Wisconsin legislature. So the, the gerrymander was as advertised. It was perfect in terms of what the Republicans wanted to do. And so what happened was activists all over Wisconsin began to talk about and organize and gather and learn about what the hell gerrymandering was. If I would have talked to you 10 years ago about this, 
the crowd would have been much smaller and you all would have been nodding off after about five minutes because, because gerrymandering and redistricting had little or no connection to people. They didn't understand how it worked. They thought it was just something that politicians did behind closed doors. Well, yeah, that's what they do in Wisconsin. They do it behind closed doors. But, the, but, the, uh, but what happens and the consequences of that exercise are profound. And over the last uh, 10 years, Wisconsinites have found um, in a very real way uh, the consequences of having one party control with no compromise on a whole host of issues. I don't have to give you go through the list of policy prescriptions that we might have had, uh, but don't because of that. But I think one of the things is it's, you know, Wisconsin is sort of an island in the upper Midwest. We're the only state uh, that doesn't have Medicaid uh, reimbursement from the federal government. We're turning down literally billions of dollars of federal money that could be used for health care in this state because Republicans in the legislature have steadfastly refused at all to open the door for Medicaid reimbursement by the federal government, which by the way is 90%, generally speaking, of the reimbursement for uh, medical costs from the federal government. And that's by the way, money you've all paid into for your federal taxes. So, so that's just one of the ways that's, that we, we've been shortchanged, but it's really more than that, as you know. And on the whole host of democracy issues that I care about and we work for, it's been a very tough uh, sled. But here is the good news. Not only did all of these activists around Wisconsin begin to understand the need for fair maps, but that finally began to get the attention not only of the Wisconsin legislature, but it also began to get the attention of candidates for the courts and specifically for the Wisconsin Supreme Court. And the Wisconsin Supreme Court, which since 20, 2007 has been controlled by a conservative majority. And when I say conservative, I'm not just talking about, you know, starry decisis and, you know, not wanting to veer very much from past precedent. What I'm talking about is radical conservative that were all, only more, more uh, than happy to often change a position that they previously held if it was to advantage the Republican party that was in power in the legislature or a Republican governor. And so we had a host of Supreme Court uh, uh, justices that were elected over the years that prescribed to sort of that radical conservative philosophy. Annette Ziegler, who's now the Chief Justice, uh, Michael Gableman, who defeated uh, Justice Louis Butler in the most scurrilous, most nasty, uh, racist campaign in the history of Wisconsin in 2008. Rebecca Bradley, uh, and, and it's always important to make the distinction between Rebecca Bradley and Ann Walsh Bradley and Rebecca Bradley. These are, these are people that are not moderate Rockefeller Republicans. These are people that are steeped in far right ideology and they were more than willing to do and change positions in order to advantage and keep that conservative majority in place. But gerrymandering became an issue, particularly after 2021, 2022, when the Republican legislature put forward more gerrymandered maps to lock into place the maps that they'd put in place in 2011. So to keep them in power in the legislature uh, without opposition virtually for the next 10 years. And they had a willing accomplice in the Wisconsin Supreme Court, the conservative majority ultimately ruled in 2022 to keep the conservative um, uh, the Republican maps in place. And they did it in a way that was really radically uh, beyond what anybody uh, had ever seen before. Because this time the governor is involved and he's involved in the redistricting process. He had vetoed the maps that the Republicans passed. So generally when you have a vetoed situation like that, it goes to the courts, and in this case, the state Supreme Court, and they are supposed to choose other maps. Well, the state Supreme Court didn't do that. They just chose the maps that Robin Boss had drawn and put into place in 2022. 
And they did it in such a way that it was, it was, it was highly questionable about the constitutionality of it. And so that became, as you know, not just, there were, there were many other issues. Uh, the Dobbs decision, obviously, uh, choice was a huge issue in 2023. But Justice Protozawitz stated the obvious. She said, the maps currently in place in Wisconsin are rigged. And that wasn't a value judgment, but that was really sort of a, uh, a, that was apparent to anybody that looked at the maps, anybody that knew anything about how the maps were drawn. They were not going to be changed through the election process. So she ran on that and that mobilized a lot of interest. And so what happened as you know, is she won the election. And then when she took office in August of last year, um, August 1st, on August 2nd, there was a lawsuit that was launched to overturn the, the rigged maps. And on February 19th of this year, after it wound its way through the process, after the Republicans last fall tried to slam through false maps based on the Iowa model redistricting process, which we strongly supported, but which they perverted to their own political advantage. And then again, when Republicans in January tried to shove through uh, other maps, uh, finally the writing was on the wall the governor vetoed all of those attempts to try to put in other types of rig maps. And the court had invited a number of people to submit new maps for them to choose. And the Republicans, of course, submitted their own rigged maps. My Democratic friends, uh, and by the way, I should tell you, I left the Republican Party in the early 80s and worked for a Democratic congressman and worked for the Democratic Senate Majority Leader in Madison for a number of years. So, so you know, I've been, I've been all over the map. And so, but my Democratic friends did what partisan Democrats do. And they said, well, no, we don't really want fair maps. We want to see if we can get maps that are really going to advantage us. And so they put forward maps by a Washington, D.C. law firm and the Democrats all kind of lined up behind the partisan maps for the Democrats. The Republicans lined up between their maps. The governor, with strong input from us and from other good government groups, said, you know, governor, here's an opportunity to actually do the right thing. You can actually put into place maps that will be competitive so that Elections will matter so that one side will not have a preordained advantage one side or the other uh, when, when these maps are in place, when ideas and the quality of candidates are going to matter in an election. And so people will have a choice. And the governor, to his great credit, despite tremendous pressure from the, Dem from the National Democratic Party, uh, and from partisan Democrats, including, I, I would mention, and I love these people and I work with them all the time, but, you know, Greta Neubauer, the Democratic leader in the Assembly, uh, the Democratic leader in the Senate, Melissa Agard, they all lined up behind the partisan Democratic maps. The governor chose the maps that he had submitted, which were fair maps, which were, which, and I'll, and I'll tell you how that will change this, this, this fall, the maps that he's chosen. Uh, so that was, I think, a very good moment for Wisconsin because it demonstrated and reflected what we are, a purple state. Uh, we're, not, we're not red, we're not blue. And the governor got that, he understood that. The other reason to support the governor's maps was that they were also the ones least likely to change before 2031 the ones least likely and least susceptible to a legal challenge. And that is because the maps that the governor signed into place were ultimately passed in the legislature. Now, this will you'll find this puzzling. It, they passed with largely Republican votes. In fact, all Republican votes. The Democrats didn't vote for the maps, for the governor's maps. The Republicans voted for them because of the choices that the court was looking at. They were the least onerous to the Republicans, because a number of the other maps that the Supreme Court was looking at 
would have given Democrats an outright gerrymandered majority. And Republicans were fearful that the court with the progressive majority might end up choosing one of those maps. So they voted for the governor's maps. And the fact that the governor's maps were passed by the legislature, and then of course signed into law by the governor, gives it the force of law, which makes them much more difficult to challenge, A, and B, overturn in another court, because it is a law, it is Act 94. Whereas a map that the Supreme Court had chosen, if that is the route that we had gone, that's much easier to challenge. In fact, it could be challenged if you have next year when Ann Walsh Bradley, who's retiring, is replaced by a conservative, you now have a 4-3 conservative majority on the Wisconsin Supreme Court. The case could be opened up immediately and the conservatives could put in uh, the Republicans could ask for and put in a you know a Republican gerrymander again. These maps that the governor signed into law are likely to stay in place until 2031, when the next redistricting process occurs. So that to us was a very compelling reason for a number of reasons. Number one, the maps were fair, but number two, do we really wanna go through this whole thing again next year? if the Supreme Court changes, at least we have some certainty and some assurance of what the maps are going to look like at the state level through the 2031 election. And I think what the result of that is very good for democracy in this way. We will now have legislative districts where for many years, the last 10 years, you haven't even had two candidates running against each other because everybody knew the outcome in some of these districts in Northern and Western Wisconsin. And Democrats didn't bother to even field a candidate. And so you're going to have state legislative candidates now running for the assembly in the state Senate in areas in Northwest Wisconsin, La Crosse, Eau Claire, Wausau, even up into the Fox Valley and Northern Wisconsin, Northeastern Wisconsin. What will that will do is that will bring out activists who will be going to doors and working to try to get people elected to the legislature, which will increase voter turnout and voter participation, I think, all over the place. Uh, it's obviously very important at the very top level, at the presidential level and for the U.S. Senate level. But if you also have candidates now running in relatively competitive seats all over the state, you're going to have a lot more ground up activity and that will increase participation and voter interest. So that is, I think, the, the, the greatest benef beneficiary. And I say that as a, as a nonpartisan, obviously, obviously, you know, people I'm not gonna vote for, but I'm just saying that it's good for democracy. It's good for everybody when you have competition like that in a state legislative election. So, so that's why I think we're in a good position for now. There's no legal challenges that are on the horizon yet uh, to the maps that the governor signed into place. Um, I don't anticipate any, although there's always, it's always possible that there will be one. Keep in mind that the United States Supreme Court 6-3 uh, conservative majority also doesn't take much for them to decide, well, let's step in here and maybe make some you know, adjustments to see if we can't push, push it over one way or the other. Uh, th that's happened in the past, unfortunately. Uh, but, but I think in Wisconsin, we did it right. So we've got, the, we've got the maps in place. The big concern for me this year is, is voting. And as I've mentioned and sort of touched upon, uh, many of the voting measures that have been put into place over the, the last number of years uh, have had something of a detrimental effect. We typically, before 2010, were number one or number two in voter turnout in the country, second only to Minnesota. We're now, we're now somewhat behind that. We're probably about 10. Uh, there, are, there still is robust participation in Wisconsin, but it could be better. 
if we didn't have some of the restrictions that we have on voting. And what's happened since Governor Evers has been uh, in office is that he has used the power of his office to veto 40 to 50 voter suppression measures that have come before the Wisconsin legislature. That, that, that's where I spend most of my time uh, is trying to mobilize public support to oppose those voter suppression uh, measures. And it's what I call death by a thousand cuts. Uh, what they try to do are make it more difficult for people in nursing homes uh, to be able to vote or to try to make it more difficult for you to re be able to return an absentee ballot on time. Uh, they've reduced, for instance, early voting in Milwaukee and Madison from three weeks prior to the election to two weeks. They've said you can no longer vote by absentee in-person ballot the day before the election or the Sunday before the election. And of course, that was aimed at the Souls to the Polls program in Milwaukee that was utilized to try to bring out voters the Sunday before uh, the November election. No voting on Sundays now. So all of those things have added over the years to make it more difficult for us to get the robust voter turnout. And it's no secret, and this isn't partisan, but what, what Republicans have calculated is if the voter turnout is less, that's good for them. What they fear is greater voter turnout. And what they fear is that if you have more people going to the polling places, that that's somehow not going to be good for them. Again, this is something as I, you know, growing up as a Republican, I never, it, it didn't make sense to me. I mean, everybody thought, well, like, yeah, you want as many people to vote for your person and they want as many people to vote for their person and that's good. But now it's sort of like uh, it's winning by subtraction. And that's a very, uh, a very serious calculation that's, that's always taken into place. And so we have things that are currently happening right now uh, that, that you know, we're always concerned about. We are now, uh, I just yesterday finalized, or Friday, we're going to be the amicus on a, on a legal brief to overturn the Wisconsin Supreme Court's decision last two summers ago, the summer of uh, 2022, that outlawed the 500 drop boxes that were around the state for the 2020 election. And there is a lawsuit now uh, that's been brought uh, and we're, we're filing an amicus to re reinstate those. Every other state in the upper mis Midwest has them. They're totally secure. You know, the, the, the other side tries to say that this is a place where uh, fraud occurs and where, you know, people can dump all kinds of illegal votes in. Well, first of all, you can't put an illegal absentee ballot into a drop, well, you could, but it wouldn't be counted because, because an absentee ballot, first of all, in order to get one, you have to show your photo ID and it has to be sent to you and it's got to be filled out the right way. It's not like, and of course they always raise the specter, it's those people from Chicago coming up and stuffing the ballot boxes. They still use that. I'm serious. But but the point is, so so these are the types of things that, that we are, are currently involved in. And the other thing that my organization is very, very much involved in is trying to make sure that we get every college and university student, public and private, to understand, A, whether the photo ID that was issued by their public or private institution is voter compliant, and then B, if it's not, where exactly they can go on campus to get it, and how to do it, and how, you know, connect the dots so that it's not a mystery for people. And that's critically important because this election in 2020, just as 2000, 2004, 2016, and 2020, those four presidential elections in Wisconsin were decided by less than 26,000 votes either way out of three and a half million votes cast. That's infinitesimal, that's one less than 1%. And it's very likely to be that close again. I'd like to think it wouldn't be that close after all we've learned and after all that's happened, but it's very possible that it will be for a, for a whole number of reasons. So the voting, uh, the fair maps, I think those things are positive. There's a lot of dark shadows 
uh, that are lurking and a lot of things that we have to be aware of and things that we're gonna have to be concerned about. But I think by and large, we are in a better place going into the 2024 election. And I'm talk talking in terms of the mechanics of the election in Wisconsin. I'm not, I'm not making value judgments on the candidates or the issues. I'm just saying about the mechanics of the election uh, than, than we were in 2024 and in, uh, even in 20, I mean, 2020 or even in, to some degree in 2022. Um, and I also think that the, the, the mindset of people about this and the idea that this is now a battle for the survival of democracy, I think resonates with far more people now uh, than it did in 2020. And it did resonate with a lot of people in 2020, but the fear of what could happen uh, if things don't go the way we hope they will, or at least I hope they will uh, in 2024, um, I think is motivating a lot of people and engaging a lot of people. So I don't mean to sound, uh, I, I, again, I try not to sound partisan, but it's hard in an in a environment that we are today. I mean, I think either you're for democracy or you're, or, or you're, or you're not doing enough to defend it. And uh, I just think at this point in our, in our history, uh, we need to continue to do everything we can uh, to do it. Let, let me finish by um, inviting your questions, your comments. Um, I have over here um, <laughs> some some uh, voting uh, issue uh, materials uh, and uh, a newsletter from Common Cause. Uh, it would invite you to uh, take it. I don't pass it out because I know a lot of people don't want to take that stuff. And I have lots of fun buttons, so please help yourself to those. Uh, but but with that, I'll open it up to questions because I know you have some of you are going to your next uh, service. Repeat the question. Take the basket on one side. I'll stun silence. That's I'm never sure if that's a good thing or not. <laughs> yes. Yes. I love it. I think it would be good. I, you know, I, I ranked choice voting is where your uh, not only your first choice is counted, but you also have a second choice. And the good thing about it is it it, it cuts down on partisanship. Uh, it makes you sort of think a little bit be out outside the box, and um, and 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 I think it, it would be good for democracy. It's got a bit of bipartisan support but it's never gonna be a reality in Wisconsin with the current legislature because the current majority uh, in both houses, the, both the assembly and the state Senate are dead set against it. Uh, they want their all or nothing uh, way of doing it. But yeah, that's, uh, it, is, uh, it is one of those, one of those democracy reforms that in a better bipartisan environment, and, and by the way, I think these fair maps will lead to that, that ranked choice voting, I think, would have a better chance of, first of all, getting a public hearing and then possibly being considered by the legislature. Yes, sir. Yes, and, and for years and years, since the last gerrymander in 2011, uh, the, the Wisconsin uh, Fair Maps community uh, and reformers have all been united around adopting the, the system that they have in place in, in our neighboring state of Iowa. And the reason for that is that the Wisconsin Constitution and the Iowa Constitution are very similar in the sense that both dictate that the legislature must have the final say on the maps. But in Iowa, what they did 50 years ago, 40 years ago, was they said, well, okay, that's fine, but the legislative partisans cannot draw the maps. The maps have to be drawn by a nonpartisan entity and use very nonpartisan criteria, like squares are good, rectangles are nice. You know, keeping cities together, counties together, those are good. You know, jagged pieces going in and out, not so good, you know. So common sense 
uh, keeping communities of interest. And that has worked remarkably well in Iowa. Um, and in Iowa, it, for 50 years, uh, there's been opportunities for them to get rid of that system, but they haven't done it. And even though currently Iowa has a Republican trifecta, they have a Republican governor and a Republican legislature. And people say, well, Jay, doesn't that, maybe I was not so good for Wisconsin. It's, it's got all right-wing Republicans. Well, I was Republican, not because of the maps. I was Republican because it's very white and rural and white rural Americans across the country have in the last 10 years been voting more Republican. But it's not a function of the maps and the districts that were drawn. Democrats vote for the redistricting process in Iowa because at least they have a fighting chance to win seats there. Whereas in Wisconsin, there is no chance. Uh, well, there is a chance now because we have new maps, but there wasn't a chance before February 19. So uh, that's, that would be the one thing. The second thing about the redistricting process, there's a move also to uh, change the constitution in Wisconsin to take the legislature completely out of the redistricting process and have a citizens commission draw the maps. And that's what's in place in the number of Western states, uh, Minnesota and Michigan now have that. But here's the difference. Those states also have the ability to do that because they have what's called binding initiative and referendum at the statewide level where you can bypass the legislature and you can put redistricting directly into the hands of a nonpartisan entity. In Wisconsin, we don't have that. We have advisory referendums and we have referendums that you, you vote for to pass constitutional amendments, but you don't have the ability to take the legislature out. You have to change the constitution. And in order to change the constitution, it has to go through past two sessions of the legislature. So the question would be, would the legislature be willing to give up the power to redistrict? And I don't know of a single Republican that has said that's a good idea. And I don't know of many Democrats that want to do that. So that's a tough thing. But I think ultimately that's the solution is to take it completely out of the hands of the partisans. And that would be something that, uh, that we're going to work for. Uh, in the meantime, we're also going to work to try to uh, do a, another track and, and, and revise the Iowa, make some tweaks to it. And by the way, we've made some tweaks to Iowa so that it's, it's more suitable for Wisconsin uh, than, than Iowa, uh, Iowa's system in place. So those would be the, the constitutional things. Yes, sir. Okay. Um, Mike, you described, I used to be a Republican. What's it? So, one of the so was I. Yeah. Uh, the media fired uh, Eric Pat. Yeah, Pat Go. But my, my comment is how do we combat what's happening with the people like Marjorie Taylor Green, um, Matt Gates, Ron Johnson? You know, uh, the, the re one of the compelling reasons to have fair maps is because Republicans have, because of gerrymandered maps, they choose their candidate in the Republican primary and in, and same with the Democrats. And so, so in the primary, you get the, you get the most extreme of both parties who really turn out. So in Marjorie Taylor Greene's district in Northwest Georgia, it's a Republican district, but all she has to do is make sure that she is far right crazy enough to make sure her base loves her. And if they do, then they will vote for her. And then she is the nominee. And then she's, because she's in the gerrymandered district in Georgia, she will win uh, that seat. If you have fair maps and if you have competitive maps, and this is a classic example of Marjorie Taylor's, I call her her, her cousin, uh, Lorena Bo Bogert in Colorado, same, same thing only with glasses. Uh, she, she has been now, uh, her district was becoming competitive. So she even moved out of that district to move to a more Republican district so she could continue to be crazy Lorena Bogert and do what she does in movie theaters, which I'm sure you're all familiar with. But the point is that it is the primaries now that decide the candidate. And look, to be honest with you, when I moved to Wisconsin in uh, the late 1980s, 
there were a number of moderate and even conservative Democrats, particularly in the Milwaukee area. You know, uh, uh, Clement Zablocki and Jerry Kletchka, you know, these were, these were sort of uh, labor Democrats, many of them pro-life, but there was diversity in the Democratic Party. And what happened over the years is as, as uh, we, we went into gerrymandering, not only did the Republicans purge all the moderates, the Dale Schultzes, the Mike Ellises, uh, the people that were willing to say, oh, another great moderate in the Milwaukee area uh, was a guy named Mar um, uh, Mark, Mark Gottlieb from Port Washington. He was, he was basically threatened with uh, extinction if he continued to vote reasonably. So, so the point being is that as the Republican moderates were all purged, the Democrats, the far left, purged many of the moderate Democrats. That's why you have such a polarized atmosphere in Madison where there's just no agreement. They can't, and that's why the Democrats, by the way, refused to vote for the governor's maps because the Republicans all voted for the governor's maps. And they said, well, what's up with that? We can't vote for those maps if the Republicans voted for them. Well, exactly. And that's actually what happens. And, you know, we tried to tell them, you're out of your friggin' minds. These maps are great for you. But they just couldn't bring themselves to do that. And the other thing, of course, was they did not want to give the Republicans the satisfaction of, you know, voting with the same maps that the Republicans voted for and letting the Republicans take credit for it. So that is what, that's the problem. It's the primary. Were there seven maps, though? Pardon me? Were there seven maps? There were seven. That, that's right. That's right. And the and the governors, but so there were there were two very partisan right wing maps, Republican maps, uh, the will maps. There were four sets of Democratic maps that were more more lefty, more Democratic leaning. But the governor's maps, which everybody always forgets, I mean, they they take currently there are. If they had been in place in 2022, just to give you an idea, we have 99 seats in the assembly. If the governor's maps had been in place in 2022, there are currently 35 Democratic seats in the assembly, uh, 64 Republican seats. If they'd been in place, the governor's maps, it would have taken it up to 48 Democratic seats, 51 Republican seats. Now, it doesn't give the Democrats an outright majority, but it's right there. It's very close. And with a couple of really good candidates, you could go over the top. And that's what we want. And by the way, in the Milwaukee area now, as you may know, um, the 8th Senate District, which is currently represented by Dan Canodal. Um, so this is the north, the north suburbs in the Ozaki County. He's now not running because the maps are fair. He's, they're no longer gerrymandered in his district. So he's not even running for the state Senate. This is Jody uh, Sinekin who's running, Habish Sinekin, which is just such a great legal name. It's got, it's got all the lawyers of Wisconsin. Habish Sinekin, it's great. But so she's running and that seat is much more competitive. So that's one of the seats likely to change. Pinotel, by the way, is running now against someone even crazier and further to the right than him, Janelle Branchen who is from Oconomowoc, and she is in league. She, she thinks Robin Ross is too liberal. She's in, league, she's in league with Michael Gableman and Mike Lindell, the pillow guy. I mean, that's, that's where she's at. So the Republicans are having their own little civil war right now, which I'm, I'm sorry it's happening, but so be it. Hold on. Yes. Yeah, Christian nationalism is, of course, as you know, um, the new term for that. And, you know, it is, it is, it's always remarkable to me how I don't care if you're a far right wing conservative Republican or a far left wing Democrat, um, the idea that the, you would support somebody like Donald Trump if you have a daughter. I mean, it's just, I mean, that alone is, that, that alone is room for far for me. But that aside, my personal my personal thing aside, and I do have a daughter, and uh, it was it was terrifying, but but the point is that yes, I I don't I don't think it's I don't think it's a thing 
it's reached critical mass in Wisconsin yet, uh, but it's certainly, you know, it certainly is on the rise everywhere. Um, and you know, I I, I don't know. I, I think I think that's why it's incumbent again, uh, by people of faith and conscience uh, who don't don't subscribe to that uh, that Christian nationalism to be very active to counter it and to promote democracy and make sure that that is not the only message that's being heard. heard. The, the only thing I'll say too about that is that the, Trump just yesterday or last week has announced this new plan for election integrity, which is, as you know, another way of saying, how can we suppress votes and throw out votes? And you know, this is just the classic example to me of the hypocrisy in Wisconsin, if you cap, uh, if you ca if you cast an absentee ballot, clerks cannot begin counting the absentee ballot until the morning of the election. They can't even sort it prior to the election. And there was very reasonable bipartisan legislation in the Wisconsin legislature to, that would allow clerks to be able to sort absentee ballots and be able to get them ready to be counted, because. What the right then says is, well, those absentee ballots are not reported until two o'clock in the morning in Milwaukee. Well, yeah, it's because they can't start counting them until the morning of the election and they have to run their election at their polling place. And it, it's not until 2 a.m. By, by the time they get it tallied. So they don't want a solution. They don't want to fix things. They want to sow confusion and doubt. And so that's what election protection is all about. And we are combating it. There are many, many organizations that will be out in force this year. By the way, these are the small things that matter. We just successfully got the Wisconsin Elections Commission to put in place a set of rules for election observers. The far right had wanted observers to be able to come and to be able to look within three feet of you when you're marking your ballot or you're casting your vote or you're telling the clerk your name. They wanted to eliminate any distance between observers and voters and election clerks. Uh, we were able to get the election, Wisconsin Elections Commission to make sure that that's three feet to eight feet, not right in the face of voters. So th these are the things that make a difference in a state like Wisconsin, and I think are gonna have, you know, individually don't sound like a lot, but collectively, uh, could make a difference. And that's how I think this election is going to be solved. Yes, and then yes. Yes. Excellent. Oh, wow. my pleasure. Yeah, there is, there is a, uh, well, so the thing to do here, um, for the election protection from our side, which means it's something a little different. Uh, that means allowing people to vote, by the way. Um, so there is there is a number, uh, but there there's there, these are toll-free numbers. I, I'm, I'm reluctant to say that's the number that you call to call the FBI, but I think if you call any of these toll-free numbers and you have a problem, they would then connect you to the FBI. So that's 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 the thing. Um, yeah, so here's the thing. I'm still on the Go break it. Yeah, that's, I'm actually I'm not even going to put it up. No, it's not they set it down there. In fact, I think Jerry, you should you should mail that to me. Right? No, no, I'll, I'll I can get it to my phone. <laughs> Bubble wrap is good. That's good. Uh, yes, Jerry. Yeah, I just got just got a comment. Uh, 
just about the effect of the resistive thing. I used to live in the first district, don't anymore, but uh, Brian Stiles had that for a long time. And now, because of resistive thing, we've got a viable candidate in that district to the market stuff. Yes. Since that one was born. Yes. Uh, so it looks like uh, there's a good chance that that district took place. So Very possible. You know, um, so the so the governor's maps that were signed in February 19th are the state legislative maps. They're not the congressional maps, but the congressional maps were made better in 2022, uh, ironically, by well the governor first and then uh, the uh, Wisconsin Supreme Court uh, and the U.S. Supreme Court said it was OK. And what he's talking about is the first congressional district, which was Paul Ryan for many years, now Brian Stile. It had been a safe Republican district by virtue of redistricting gerrymandering in 2000. But what happened was in this new redistricting, Beloit was put back in, the city of Beloit, into the first district. That's a heavily Democratic city. And so as a consequence, the first district, and they took some Waukesha County, uh, Walworth County uh, areas out of it. So as a, as a result, the first district is 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 competitive and Barco was a congressman from 93 to 95 longtime democratic leader in the assembly um, also in the department of revenue secretary for governor evers and from a key battleground kenosha and just a little inside politics uh he was he was urged very strongly to run for the seat uh because the Biden campaign would like to have, and Tammy Baldwin want to have a, you know, obviously a good turnout in, in Kenosha, and he being from Kenosha would help. But he's a very good quality guy, a very smart guy, and someone who's decent and good on all these issues. So that is a possibility. The other, the other one, and I, I'd be, I would be lax if I didn't mention this. Uh, the biggest bully of the delegation is the newest. His name is Derek Van Orden. Uh, he's from. Um, Prairie du Chien, which is a lovely little town. I don't know what water he drank, but he's he's uh, anyway. Anyway, that is a very that is a very competitive district too. And again, although we don't endorse candidates, there's a very good quality candidate that's uh, that I think I think would would be able to take him out. That's Katrina Shanklin, who is from uh, Stevens Point, and that's the part of the district that was gerrymandered some years ago. But what's good about that is that. It was, it was, it was, but it was kept that way. And uh, it, well, it was, it was gerrymandered to help Ron Kind. Right, right, to make the seventh, uh, the Northwestern district. But in any event, Shanklin is from that part of the district that's not as well known to the population centers, Eau Claire and La Crosse. And so I, my, my view is that she would, she would do very well, but that's just my own view. Yes, Alice. Well, you know, I mean, it's always it's always going to be a dogfight because we're a 50-50 state. The difference between this year and, and past years is that uh, Hubdi's already on television. Of course, she is, too. Uh, one of the reasons she was able to do so well is uh, she was able to define Tommy Thompson in 2012 as a kind of out-of-touch old guy who wasn't, you know, in, in touch with Wisconsin anymore. And she was also able to... Um, you know, amass a lot of money against Leah Buchmer in 2018, who was in a primary. No primary for Eric Hovde. Having said that, I don't know if you've ever seen Hovde. He's uh, he's very tall and very, uh, well, he's got a, I think, a weird mustache. That's my own view. Uh, he's from California, and that's a prominent part of Tammy's uh, uh, campaign stuff. <laughs> you know, look, I'm, I'm, I'm being a little facetious. It's going to be a tough fight. It's, you know, if she wins, and I'm hopeful she would, that she would, it'll be always, it's never going to be more than 52, 48, or 53, 47. It's always going to be tough. It's a eight million of his own right away. Exactly. That's right. But the thing you should know about Tammy Baldwin is nobody uh, in the United States Senate has greater capacity to raise money than Tammy Baldwin. She is a machine. And she's the incumbent, and she's, she's out there. So, you know, she's, uh, so it, it would be, it's going to be tough. But having said that, with no Republican primary, you know, it's possible. 
Jay probably has to get back to Madison sometime. You know, it's kind of a little bit of Yeah, if anyone wants to stay, uh, stay around and ask anything, that's fine. Well, how, how much time do you have? Do you yeah, have, have 10 minutes, yeah, whatever. I mean, in no hurry. All right. Why don't we just ask a few more yeah. questions? And, so. Yeah, happy to, happy to talk to you and entertain you. I know some jokes. Yes, sir. Well, until 1987, we had something called the Fairness Doctrine, uh, which was in place and governed the federal federal law that governed the airwaves that required uh, some, at least some degree of truth in what was being said on television and in the news. Uh, so I don't know if that's the route that you go. The, pro the problem, and I'm sure you are all well aware of this, uh, is mis media consolidation and you know, the Milwaukee Journal Sentinel, um, when Mike Drew was there and uh, others, it was the organ, it was the voice of conscience on a lot of these issues. And it's now that Gannett has downsized and destroyed the Journal Sentinel. And, and by the way, Gannett owns all of the papers, not just in Milwaukee, but all throughout the Fox Valley in Northern Wisconsin. Wausau, Appleton, Green Bay, all of those, it's just destroyed. And, and now they're even dropping the Associated Press from coverage. So, so that is a huge problem because people get their news from silos and they get their news from, and you know how it works. If you go to a progressive website, then that's the kind of stuff you're going to see in your, your feed. Uh, in your your news feed, it's, uh, it's so I don't I don't have an answer to that. What, what I do know is that if there's more on the ground activism, and there are more people that are talking to other people directly, um, and and doing doors and going to things like this and talking to their neighbors, that's always anyway the most effective way to to get information out to people. So there just has to be a lot more of that, uh, particularly this year. Yes. Uh, you know, you, you know, I think yes, at some point, I, you know, the problem is that uh, you have to, you'd have to get to people to agree on what that holiday would be, but, but I do, but I do think that the realization that, you know, the first Tuesday in November is, was an, it was picked for some reason 150 years ago. I'm not even sure why, what the reason was. I'm not sure, but it, whatever it is, it's no longer relevant. So, yeah, you know, I think somebody with some, I'm not, I, I don't have imagination, but if someone with imagination could think of what, what to do, that would be, that would be smart. And, you know, the other thing too, is that um, I think because of the pandemic, people much more in Wisconsin now do vote by absentee ballot. You don't need uh, so that's that's essentially voting by mail, and if you have if you can vote by mail, and then you have but but you also have secure drop boxes, because the other thing we did in Wisconsin it used to be that if your absentee ballot arrived and was postmarked by the election it would be counted, now it has to arrive at the clerk's office by election otherwise it's thrown out, so thousands of votes were thrown out in 2020 and 2022 because they didn't arrive in time. What I'm suggesting is that voting by mail would be sort of, instead of a national holiday, would, would might be something that we, we can move towards. In some states, Colorado and, and Oregon do it almost entirely by mail. You know, um, it's a, I, well, we're sort of going there now because there's been a number of states that have now passed, and of course, they, as you might imagine, they're all states that have blue majorities in democratic uh, legislatures and governors. But there's now a uh, movement throughout states that says if the popular vote in the state votes for a particular candidate, and that is, you know, that's the case, then that we as states 
decree that the president of the United States would be the person who gets the popular votes. So it's sort of a state endorsement of direct popular vote over the electoral college. You know, I don't, I don't know what the process would, the process to eliminate the electoral college would be next to impossible because as you might imagine, uh, Wyoming, North Dakota, <laughs> you know, they all have two, two US senators and they would block it. I mean, all those states that have two senators that are from are tiny. I mean, I don't possibly even Bernie Sanders might oppose. I, I don't know, but I'm just saying that because of that, you would never get that kind of constitutional amendment through the U.S. Congress to get it done. So it has to be done by states. Uh, and there's another there's another thing called a constitutional convention, which we don't want to do. We don't want to have a Article Five constitutional convention. So. But anything? Yes. Well, he. Wow. Well, yes, he he. You know, he does seem reasonable compared to Michael Gableman and Janelle Branch and Dan Canodal and some of these other people. But he is very much the architect of the state that we have today with, with the polarized politics. I didn't even, I didn't even get into it, but, but it was Robin Voss and then Senate Majority Leader Scott Fitzgerald in 2015 that completely dismantled uh, democracy, particularly not only our campaign finance system, but they eviscerated and destroyed the Government Accountability Board, which was an independent entity that investigated corruption uh, in Wisconsin had separate funding and it was Walker together with Voss and Fitzgerald that destroyed that so that they could be in charge. And the, and the, and the other thing about Voss, he was the architect of the plan to make sure that Demo or Republican legislative leaders and Democrats, legislative leaders could take unlimited money from special interest groups. There used to be limits, 150,000 every two years. Now uh, millions of dollars can flow into Robin Voss and of course, with that amount of money at his disposal, he's the absolute czar of the legislature. So I, I, I hear what you're saying, but you know that's kind of like saying Mussolini compared to some other people was, yeah. You know, at least he liked good Italian food. You know, it's just, it's, I don't, I don't buy into it. <laughs> anyway, anything else? Thank you. I I enjoyed it as always. I always enjoy it. Thank you. Always a pleasure.